Okay, we are ready to start. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, just give me a minute. Uh, sir, just I will do. Uh, you have to click on the PowerPoint. Just I'll I'll it? I'll help you. I'll help you out. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, good evening everybody welcome to this evening episode of pursue this is pursue 19d which is hematology hemostasis and thrombosis we are streaming live from north bengal medical college and hospital via kolkata we have a very interesting topic which is thrombocytopenia heparin induced thrombocytopenia and reactive thrombocytosis and to talk on that we have dr rupsha dattapal she is an mbbs honors gold medalist from the famous patna medical college MD pathology from North Bengal and presently she is an assistant professor in the North Bengal Medical College with areas of interest in cytopathology, histopathology and hematology. Before I ask Dr. Paul to start, let me request all of you to keep your mic muted, your camera off and please don't share your screen. With this, let me request uh, Dr. Shapal ma'am, please share your screen and let us start. Okay, Just press on that arrow. Yes. Uh, press your entire screen, that thing. Yes. Sir. And once that black screen comes, press in the center and press share. Great. Your screen is visible. Please just open your PowerPoint from the taskbar. Just double yes. click on that. Yes. Sir. Make it full screen and press that yes. hide. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ma'am, you are good to go. Please start. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Today's topic of my discussion is thrombocytopenia. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is the mechanism by which the loss of the blood from the vascular system is controlled after vascular injury by a complex interaction of the vessel wall, the platelets, and the plasma proteins. Following the vessel injury, hemostasis occurs in two two stages that is primary and secondary the primary hemostasis is the initial stage during which the vascular wall and the platelets interact to limit the amount of blood loss from the damaged vessels while during the stage of secondary hemostasis a stable fibrin clot is formed via the activation of the coagulation casket although formation is necessary to arrest bleeding but ultimately this blood clot has to be dissolved so as to resume the normal blood flow this process of dissolution of blood clot is known as fibrinolysis. Now coming to the role of platelets in the primary hemostasis after vascular injury, platelets have three important roles. They are first platelet adhesion, second the release reaction of the platelet granules and third is the platelet aggregation where fibrinogen acts as the bridge. This is a diagram showing the role of platelets in normal hemostasis. Once the vessel wall is injured and the subendothelial connective tissue is exposed, the platelets adhere to this subendothelial collagen. The adhesion is nothing but the binding of the platelets to the subendothelial collagen via the GP1B. The von Willebrand factor helps for the adhesion of these platelets. The congenital absence of GP1B that is known as the Bernard Solia syndrome or congenital absence of the von Willebrand factor in plasma that is known as the von Willebrand disease causes defective platelet adhesion and bleeding disorder. Platelets normally circulate as round to oval disc like structures in the circulation. With activation, the platelets undergo shape change which is due to reorganization of the microtubules and contraction of the actomycin of the microfilaments. 
immediately after addition and shape change release reaction that is secretion of the platelet granules occur adp is released from the dense granules this promotes platelet aggregation the platelet factor 4 is released from the alpha granules which neutralizes the anticoagulant activity of heparin while the platelet derived growth factor stimulates smooth muscle and skin fibroblast proliferation thereby promoting wound healing activated platelets also secrete thromboxin a2 which induces platelet aggregation and local vasoconstriction after that platelet aggregation takes place platelet aggregation is nothing but the binding of the platelets to each other the adp which is released from the platelets cause inhibition of adenyl cyclase and reduction in the level of the cyclic anp a configurational change in the membrane occurs so that the gp2b 3a receptors become exposed on the surface binding of the fibrinogen molecules to the gp2b 3a receptors on adjacent platelets cause platelet aggregation the activated platelets release adp and thromboxin a2 and so a self sustaining reaction is generated leading to the formation of the platelet plug thrombin which is generated from the coagulation pathway is a potent platelet aggregating agent and it also converts fibrinogen to fibrin thus fibrin together with the aggregated mass of platelets at the site of injury forms a hemostatic plug now coming to the tropic proper thrombocytopenia as you all know may be defined as a subnormal number of platelets in the circulating blood the normal platelet count varies from 1 lakh platelets are sequestered in the spleen normally but in times of increased demand the platelet production can rise manifold now coming to the causes of thrombocytopenia thrombocytopenia can be broadly defined depending upon the underlying mechanism it may be either artifactual thrombocytopenia can occur as a result of decreased platelet production or increased platelet destruction there may be abnormal platelet distribution or pooling which is known as distributional thrombocytopenia last but not the least is dilutional thrombocytopenia which occurs after massive blood transfusion the most common mechanisms of thrombocytopenia are impaired platelet production and increased destruction this is a diagram showing the pathogenesis of thrombocytopenia as you can see bone marrow hypoplasia or disordered regulation of thrombopoiesis or inept thrombopoiesis may lead to decreased platelet production there is splenomegaly and hypersplenism there is abnormal pooling of the platelets leading to distributional thrombocytopenia again if there is platelet destruction in the periphery it may lead to thrombocytopenia which may be due to either due to th uh, immune causes or due to non immune causes so artifactual thrombocytopenia may be due to platelet clumping which is caused by anticoagulant dependent immunoglobulins that is known as serothrombocytopenia which is most commonly seen after edta platelet satellitism giant platelets decreased platelet production may again be due to hereditary causes or due to acquired causes there are many hereditary causes and today i'll not be focusing on the hereditary causes as splenomegaly and hypersplenism may lead to distributional thrombocytopenia and dilutional thrombocytopenia occurs after massive blood transfusion now coming to the clinical features of thrombocytopenia most conditions of thrombocytopenia are associated with bleeding but there are conditions which are associated with thrombotic complications like thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura dic and heparin induced thrombocytopenia in case of thrombocytopenia the site of bleeding is generally superficial and they manifest as petechiae ecchymosis gingival bleeding and epistaxis there may be uh, chances of menorrhagia gastrointestinal bleeding severe complications like intracranial bleeding may also occur but in coagulation factor manifestations in coagulation factor def uh, deficiencies the bleeding into the joints and soft tissue occur coming to the approach to a thrombocytopenic patient so a thrombocytopenic patient presents with 
but with weak spots, echinosis, mucous membrane, bleeding, etc. And there are a wide range of differentials. So the diagnostic approach should be systematic, which is composed of thorough history taking and clinical examination. This is followed by laboratory investigations, which include certain screening tests, followed by certain specific tests, which depend upon the result of the screening tests. And these help to come at a definitive diagnosis. So to ascertain the cause of thrombocytopenia, we should take a proper history and complete clinical examination is done, where we see for the nature of the bleeding, the site of bleeding, if there is any previous history of bleeding, family history, any history of drug intake or alcohol intake, whether there is any underlying disorder. And under clinical examination, it's very important to note the spleen, whether it is palpable or not. Coming to the labor laboratory investigations, peripheral blood smear examination is the most important, which is followed by bone marrow examination in certain cases and the coagulation profile. So the salient features of diagnosis of thrombocytopenia are first, the type of bleeding is superficial, the platelet count is low, which is confirmed by the low platelet count in the peripheral blood smear. Coagulation profile, the bleeding time is increased, the clotting time, the prothrombin time and APTT are generally normal. And the subsequent laboratory in evaluation is directed by the findings of the screening tests. This is the algorithm showing a case of thrombocytopenia and the differentials and what we should do. First, whenever we get, get a case of thrombocytopenia, we have to go for ex examination of the peripheral blood smear where we can differentiate between two thrombocytopenia and artifactual thrombocytopenia. If there is platelet clumping, we can think the plate thrombocytopenia is due to artifactual cause. Two th uh, then we see whether the two thrombocytopenia is isolated or it is associated with certain disorders of the RBCs or the WBCs. If there is presence of giant platelets with or without WBC inclusions, we can think of hereditary thrombocytopenia. Again, if the thrombocytopenia is associated with presence of cystocytes in the peripheral blood smear, we can think of TTPHUS syndrome and DIC. Then we will go for further investigations like LDH, bilirubin, haptoglobin, PT, APTT, D-dimers, FDP, etc. If there is presence of blast, nucleated RBCs, pelgahio, abnormalities of the neutrophils, dacrocytes, etc., then we will think probably it is due to a primary bone marrow disorder and then we can go for bone marrow examination. Again, if there is presence of microspherocytes, or there is presence of RBC clumping or agglutination, we can consider Evans syndrome and then we can go for the direct agglutination test, reticulocyte count, LDH, bilirubin, etc. Now, if thrombocytopenia is associated with lymphocytes with presence of reactive lymphocytes or neutrophilia with presence of toxic granulation, we will consider infective causes and then we will go for inflammatory markers like ESR, CRP, viral markers, blood culture, etc. Again, if there is isolated thrombocytopenia, we can think of a number of causes like ITP, drug-induced thrombocytopenia, H. pylori or HCV or HIV-associated uh, thrombocytopenia, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or disseminate intravascular coagulation. Now coming to artifactual thrombocytopenia. Artifactually low platelet count may be due to in vitro clumping of the platelets. The platelet counts are reduced on automated cell counters because they cannot differentiate platelet clumps from individual cells. The overall incidence in hospitalized adult patients is approximately 1%. This may be either due to antibody mediated agglutination as seen in case of EDTA dependent agglutination and platelet satellitism or due to aggregation secondary to platelet activation resulting from improper blood sampling techniques or delayed mixing with the anticoagulants. Artifactual thrombocytopenia is always confirmed by peripheral blood smear examination which shows platelet clumps and we should go for a repeat blood te uh, count test with other anticoagulants like citrate or heparin which will reveal normal platelet count. Coming to EDTA induced thrombocytopenia. EDTA dependent agglutinins are present in about 0.1% of the normal population. 
and the platelet clumping results from the presence of the naturally occurring EDTA dependent antiplatelet antibody which are mainly of the IgG type. EDTA alters the conformation of the GP2B3A complex and exposes new antigens. The, this EDTA dependent antibodies then react with this cryptic antigen and causes platelet clumping and this platelet clumping only occurs in vitro. This is the peripheral blood smear examination picture showing the platelets, clumping of the platelets. Now coming to platelet satellitism, antibodies directed against GP2B3A react simultaneously with the FC receptor 3 of the leukocytes, especially of the neutrophils and monocytes and the platelets form a rosette around this neutrophils and the monocytes. Now coming to aplastic anemia, as you all know, aplastic anemia is characterized by pancytopenia that results from failure of the marrow hematopoiesis. However, some patients with myelodysplastic syndrome or e-megakaryocytic thrombocytopenia may present with low platelet count and then progress to pancytopenia and aplastic anemia. So we can see that aplastic anemia may be a cause of thrombocytopenia or the thrombocytopenia may progress to pancytopenia and aplastic anemia. Some deplastic anemia results from an autoimmune attack directed against the hematopoietic stem cells. And the diagnosis can be confirmed with the help of bone marrow examination, that is we go for bone marrow trifine biopsy. Nutritional deficiency also can cause thrombocytopenia, especially when it is associated with vitamin B12 deficiency when the latter results from autoantibodies which are directed against the parietal cells or the intrinsic factor and this is associated with immune thrombocytopenia. Various other autoimmune disorders may coexist with this type of immune thrombocytopenia. Now coming to an important topic that is immune thrombocytopenia which was previously referred to as idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. Immune thrombocytopenia occurs when platelets undergo premature destruction as a result of autoantibody or immune complex deposition on their membranes. We must remember that it is a diagnosis of exclusion. It may be primary or secondary and it is characterized by peripheral thrombocytopenia with a normal or increased number of megakaryocytes and absence of splenomegaly. Patients have no identifiable underlying cause like infections collagen vascular disease, drugs, etc., they are diagnosed to be suffering from primary ITP. Now, primary ITP, immune thrombocytopenia, can be of two types, that is acute and chronic. Acute ITP is defined when thrombocytopenia lasts for less than six months and usually resolves spontaneously. This most commonly affects children in the age group of two to six years and young adults and the peak incidence is in the winter and spring which follows the incidence of viral infection and here there is no sex preponderance. In acute ITP, antiviral antibodies cross react with the platelet antigens or the immune complexes of viral antigens and host antiviral antibodies bind to the FC receptors on the platelets and thus cause immune destruction of the platelets. On the other hand, chronic ITP lasts for more than six months and chronic ITP generally occurs more commonly in females. The female to male ratio is 3 to 1. The spleen is not palpable and in the presence of splenomegaly, an alternative diagnosis should be considered. Some patients have asymptomatic thrombocytopenia and are discovered incidentally during routine blood counts and chronic ITP is an indolent disease with remissions and recurrences. Now coming to the pathogenesis of chronic ITP. Chronic ITP is caused by and are subsequently removed by the mononuclear phagocytic system via the macrophage FC gamma receptors and this destruction generally occurs in the spleen and the liver. These antibodies are also directed against the megakaryocytes. As the antibodies block the GP2B3A they, in addition to causing platelet destruction, also cause platelet dysfunction. A 
compensatory increase in others, the platelet production is impaired due to intramedullary destruction of the antibody-coated platelets or by inhibition of megacabiopoiesis. Thrombocytopenia mainly occurs due to the shortening of the platelet survival. The spleen plays a crucial role. First, the antiplatelet antibodies are produced in the spleen and the destruction of the sensitized platelets mainly occur in the spleen. This is a chart showing the differences between acute ITP and chronic ITP, which already I discussed. Uh, here, the, the spontaneous remission generally occurs in acute ITP in 80% of cases, whereas in chronic ITP, spontaneous remission is uncommon and the platelet count in acute ITP is below 20,000 per microliters, whereas in chronic ITP, it varies from 30 to 80,000 per cubic millimeter. Spontaneous bleeding into the skin in the form of PTK is characteristic. Hemorrhagic manifestations are of the purpuric type and the severity and frequency of the hemorrhagic ma manifestations correlate with the platelet count. Intracranial hemorrhage, although rare, is the most serious complication of ITP. Excessive bleeding often follows after tooth extractions and tonsillectomy and this may be the first suggestion that the person is suffering from ITP. In that case, we don't need a bone marrow examination. That means bone marrow examination is not mandatory to diagnose a case of ITP. Antiplatelet antibodies are raised, but as they are not specific, we generally do not go for the detection of the antiplatelet antibodies. And they also require reference labs for the detection. Coming to the treatment of sensitized platelets. Acute ITP is a self-limited disorder and management is generally supportive, but in case of severe bleeding, oral steroids or IV immunoglobulins can be given. In life-threatening bleeding, platelet transfusion along with high-dose IV steroids or IV immunoglobulins are given. In case of asymptomatic chronic ITP, no treatment is required, but in symptomatic patients where the platelet count falls below 30,000 cubic millimeter, the initial treatment is with corticosteroids. IV immunoglobulins globulins may be tried in patients unresponsive to steroids. Indications for splenectomy are failure to respond to steroids, relapse and high dose of steroids needed to maintain remission. Only a small, small percentage of patients who take a particular drug and genetic and environmental factors have a role to play. Drugs cause thrombocytopenia by different mechanisms of which Direct toxicity, dose-dependent myelosuppression, and immune destruction of the platelets are important mechanisms. It should be suspected when patient has recurrent episodes of thrombocytopenia with prompt recovery. Generally, drug-induced thrombocytopenia develops within one to two weeks after daily drug exposure, but the, but the thrombocytopenia may develop exposure if the patient has already been exposed to the same drug. Results within five to seven days of drug discontinuation. Drugs which cause thrombocytopenia are many of which quinine, quinidine, heparin, gold salts, apsiximab are important. Treatment includes discontinuation of the drug, platelet transfusion and administration of IV. Immunoglobulins may be helpful in certain cases. Now coming to an important topic that is heparin induced thrombocytopenia. It is an important topic in the present scenario because heparin is widely used as an anticoagulant for the treatment of treatment and prevention of thromboembolic disorders. Although bleeding is the most common adverse uh, adverse reaparin, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which is also known as the white clot syndrome, is a potentially severe, although paradoxical, immune-mediated complication of heparin therapy, which is associated with thrombosis. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia differs from other causes of drug-induced thrombocytopenia in two ways. In heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, the thrombocytopenia is not usually severe, that is, counts rarely fall below 20,000. And HIT is not associated with bleeding, rather, it markedly raises the risk of thrombotic complications. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is a life-threatening disorder which may occur after exposure to the various forms of heparin. 3 to 5 percent of patients during or after unfractionate, unfractionated heparin therapy for 5 days or more 
while the incidence is about less than 1% during low molecular weight heparin therapy. Heparin induced thrombocytopenia is characterized by a decrease in platelet count of more than 50% from the highest platelet count value after the start of heparin, developing typically between 5 to 14 days after the commencement of heparin therapy. It is characterized by hypercoagulability and the presence of heparin dependent platelet activating IgG type of antibodies. A platelet count fall before 5 days of heparin therapy is unlikely clinical challenge as patients may develop thrombocytopenia with or without thrombosis days to weeks after heparin cessation. Heparin induced thrombocytopenia more commonly affects surgical patients and is more common in females. There are two types of hit, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is the hit disorder. Type 1 hit occurs within the first 2-3 days of heparin therapy and the platelet count normalizes after the discontinuation of heparin therapy. It is a non-immune disorder and results from the direct effect of heparin on platelet activation and it is known as heparin-associated thrombocytopenia. While type 2 hit is an immune-mediated disorder that typically occurs 5 to 14 days after heparin exposure and often has life and limb threat threatening thrombotic complications. In general medical practice, hit actually refers to the type 2 hit and from uh, 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 classify type 2 hit as hit. This is the uh, chart showing the differences between the immune and the non immune type of heparin induced thrombocytopenia. In type 1 hit, the severity of thrombocytopenia is mild, where the, where the platelet count usually remains above 1 lakh, whereas in type 2 hit, that is an immune mediated hit. The generally, the severity of thrombocytopenia the, uh, is severe to moderate, where the mean platelet count is about 60,000. The thrombotic complications are common in type 2 in type 2 hit. Several thrombotic complications coming to the pathogenesis of hit, that is type 2 hit. Platelet activation in vivo results in release of platelet factor 4. This platelet factor 4 is actually a tetrameric platelet alpha granule constituent which is liberated into the brain. platelet factor. Hit results from the binding of these antibodies of antibodies that is of the IgG type to the heparin PF4 complex which, which form immune complex that triggers a 2A receptor that leads to platelet activation and formation of thrombogenic microparticles. The end result is development of thrombocytopenia in the setting of a profound hypercoagulable state. This is the pathophysiology behind HIT where we can see on activation of the platelets, the platelet factor 4 are liberated in the blood and they come to the exterior of the platelet. The heparin combines with this platelet factor 4 to form the uh, immune complexes which combine with the IgG type of the antibodies, IgG type of immunoglobulins forming immune complexes which cross link with the, the play, uh, through the FC receptors causing platelet activation. These sensitized platelets are removed by the splenic macrophages causing thrombocytopenia on the one hand. Then the, the platelet activation causes platelet release reaction, platelet aggregation and thrombosis. And these platelet activation also releases procoagulant microparticles which also helps in increasing the thrombotic complications. Coming to the complications of it, heparin induced thrombocytopenia associated thrombocytosis, uh, thrombosis is the most feared complication. About 50% of patients with HIT have been noted to develop life or limb threatening thrombosis. The thrombotic tendency generally lasts for at least 30 days. Thrombosis can develop even after the discontinuation of heparin and platelet count recovery. Venous thrombosis is more common than arterial thrombosis and extremity deep vein thrombosis is most frequent followed by pulmonary embolism and cerebral sinus thrombosis. Arterial thrombosis generally affects the extremities although stroke, myocardial infarction and renal art artery thrombosis may also occur. Patients who have pre-existing vascular lesions or presence of intravascular catheters, sepsis or post-operative venous stasis are more susceptible to develop 
hit associated thrombotic complications other clinical manifestations include some skin lesions adrenal vein thrombosis which lead to hemorrhagic infarction this heparin induced skin lesions occur in response to subcutaneous unfractionate heparin injections and the skin lesions develop at the site of heparin injection and can they and they can range from painful red plaques to over skin necrosis acute systemic that is anaphylactoid reactions may occur following iv heparin bolus these are the clinical manifestations of heparin like deep vein thrombosis venous gangrene skin necrosis etc now coming to the diagnosis of hit hit is primarily a clinical diagnosis hit should be strongly suspected in any patient who develops thrombocytopenia while receiving heparin therapy diagnosis should be strongly considered in any patient in whom the platelet count falls below 50% of the baseline value after the fifth day of heparin therapy a 30% fall in baseline platelet count combined with any form of thrombosis in a patient receiving heparin should be considered due to hit unless proved otherwise limitations of the laboratory assays for hit has led to the development of a clinical scoring system which, which is known as a 4t scoring system so as to determine the pre test probability of hit this is the 4t prediction for diagnosis of hit thrombocytopenia the timing of the platelet count fall thrombosis or uh, presence of thrombosis or other sequelae and other causes of thrombocytopenia if present the scoring is from 0 to 8 and if the score is below 3 mean 3 or below 3 there is a low probability of it if there is the score is 4 to 5 there is an intermediate probability of it and if the score is more than 6 that is 6 to 8 there is a high chance of developing hit the scoring system this 40 scoring system has a high negative predictive value so a low pre test score may be useful in ruling out the diagnosis of hit coming to the laboratory testing for hit as hit is a clinical pathological diagnosis it requires a combined evaluation of clinical examination and laboratory test results use of the clinical scoring system that is the 40 t scoring system is recommended to establish the need for further diagnostic laboratory testing in hit because of the limitations of the laboratory assays for hit monitoring of the platelet count and a high index of clinical suspicion are essential whenever heparin is administered currently available in vitro diagnosis diagnostic tests for hit are the immunoassays and the functional assays if the 4t score is elevated the next step is screening with the immunological assay this immunological assays also have a high negative predictive value so when it is positive it should be followed by functional assays for confirmation but if the immunological assays are negative then this is not followed by functional assays and we can rule out the diagnosis of it this is the algorithm when we clinically suspect hit we first go for the 4t scoring system the 4t scoring system if the score is low that is 0 to 3 then lab test is not necessary if alternate diagnosis is present if alternate diagnosis is uncertain then we have to perform immunoassay if the immunoassay shows negative result we can rule out hit but if it shows a positive result then we have to consider functional assay in the form of serotonin release assay for the definitive diagnosis if there is an intermediate score of 4 to 5 we have to perform immune assay and while we are waiting for the results we stop heparin and initiate an alternate anticoagulant in the form of the direct thrombin inhibitors if the if the immune assay shows negative result it is unlikely if immune assay shows positive re result it is probably it is probable and if it is more than 1 od units it is most probable to have hit then we consider serotonin release assay for the definitive diagnosis if the score is high 
that means there is high chance of hit in that case we perform immunoassay while we await the immunoassay results we stop heparin initiate alternate initiate alternate anticoagulants in the form of direct thrombin inhibitors if the result is negative hit is unlikely and if we have a positive result on immunoassay hit is diagnosed and we don't have to go for the functional assay when the 4t score is high coming to the immunological assays the immunoassays detect the presence of heparin pa4 antibody using the elisa technique hit elisas have high sensitive sensitivity but poor specificity for diagnosis and therefore it is helpful to exclude a diagnosis of hit in conjunction with pretest probability most of the immunoassays detect the igg igm and iga antibodies but only the igg antibodies are pathognomonic elisa igg have also been developed nowadays and igg testing has are done in certain reference labs so elisa igg testing has a high negative predictive value and so hit is unlikely in patients with a negative antibody test the reliability of an immunoglobulin elisa in diagnosing hit can be improved by considering the positivity of the result that is if the higher optical density values in an elisa are associated with a increased likelihood of positive functional assay results and clinical hit as not all patients with a positive elisa will have hit functional assays are useful for further evaluation functional assays actually detect the platelet aggregation or the platelet activation after exposure to suspected hit serum and heparin there are a number of functional assays of which heparin induced platelet activation the serotonin release assays are important the carbon 14 serotonin release assay is considered the gold standard for hit diagnostic confirmation the serotonin release assay actually employs wash donor platelets which detects and detects their activation by measuring the release of endogenous serotonin that is induced by addition of patient serum in the presence of heparin coming to the management of fit the goal is to reduce the thrombotic risk of thrombotic complications by reducing platelet activation and thrombin generation so we have to discontinue all forms of fit and we have to initiate an alternate anticoagulant coming to the treatment of hit the initial treatment is to discontinue the heparin exposure even the heparin coated catheters have to be removed initiation of alternative anticoagulant is done usually the direct thrombin inhibitors like agitropan lepirudin or valerid are used direct thrombin inhibitors substitute as monotherapy until the collection of platelet count at which time the bridging therapy with warfarin is started warfarin should never be used as a sole alternative anticoagulant in hit the role of warfarin in the treatment of hit has long been disputed this is because of its relatively slow on count and subsequent initiation of warfarin both warfarin and the direct thrombin inhibitors are continued for at least 5 days when hit is not associated with thrombosis then warfarin therapy is continued for a period of 4 weeks and if hit is associated with thrombosis then warfarin therapy for a period of 12 weeks is recommended because of the complexity of diagnosis and treatment of hit hit prevention should be emphasized patients receiving unfractionated heparin should have platelet count monitoring at baseline and at least every third day between the day 5 and day 14 of heparin exposure heparin re-exposure should be averted in patients with history of hit low molecular weight heparin or fondaparinox that is factor 10a inhibitor may be preferable to unfractionated heparin for both treatment and prevention of thromboembolic diseases now coming to alloimmune cause of thrombocytopenia that is neonatal thrombocytopenia when the fetal platelets uh, when the fetal platelets possessing paternally derived antigens lacking in the mother enter the maternal circulation during gestation or delivery formation of allo antibodies is stimulated these maternal antibodies 
are of the immunoglobulin G type and they cross the placenta and cause destruction of the fetal platelets. The most common antigen against which antibodies are formed is HPA1 alpha. The condition is self-limited, usually resolves by three weeks after delivery. In severe cases, purpura and hemorrhages are evident at birth or they may manifest within a few hours. Severe symptomatic thrombocytopenia is treated by platelet transfusion, which is obtained from the mother. Alloimmune neonatal thrombocytopenia should be distinguished from other causes of neonatal thrombocytopenia like other congenital causes like Fanconi anemia, Viscot Aldridge, Berners Solia, etc. or congenital non-inherited thrombocytopenia caused by drugs, infections or congenital leukemia. Coming to post-transfusion purpura, it is a rare but serious complication of a blood component transfusion in which severe thrombocytopenia occurs 5 to 10 days after transfusion. It has a sudden onset and bleeding may be severe, most commonly affect females. It typically occurs after RBC transfusion, although it can occur after any blood component transfusion. The transfusion recipient has antibodies against the human platelet specific antigens acquired through prior transfusion, transplant or pregnancy. Anti-HPA antibody destroys the autologous platelets. Detection of the HPA antibodies can be performed in reference labs. The main stage stay of treatment is IV immunoglobulins. Other modalities include glucocorticoids and therapeutic plasma exchange. Pla platelet transfusion is not helpful in the acute phase. Now coming to disseminated intravascular coagulation. It is a consumptive coagulopathy which occurs second, as a secondary complication to a variety of disease. It is characterized by activation of the intravascular coagulation with microvascular thrombi formation, thrombocytopenia, depletion of the clotting factors, variable bleeding complications, and end organ damage. It is of two types, acute and chronic. Treatment is to address the underlying cause. Administration of coagulation factors and platelets are done. And heparin and protein C are administered for anticoagulation. And this is the pathophysiology of DIC where we can see sepsis, massive tissue destruction, endothelial injury, all cause tissue factor, release of tissue factor. Endothelial injury will cause platelet evolution, may cause ischemic tissue damage. Then widespread microvascular thrombosis causes activation of plasmin, fibrinolysis occur, and the proteolysis of the clotting factors take place, which leads to bleeding. Because of the consumption of the clotting factors, and platelets as well as because of the proteolysis of the clotting factors bleeding occur coming to acute dic it is commonly seen in severe sepsis septic shock in cases of obstetric complications like abrupt shock placenta preeclampsia after abo incompatible blood transfusion and as a complication of apml that is acute promyelocytic leukemia it is a consumptive coagulopathy in this case is severe and it leads to bleeding manifestations and frequent organ damage. The lab findings include low platelet or falling platelet counts on repeat testing, prolonged PT and APTT, low fibrinogen and or falling levels on repeat testing, low levels of coagulation inhibitors, increased levels of FDP and D dimers. On peripheral blood smear examination, there will be presence of cystocytes. Coming to chronic DIC, in chronic DIC, there is a slow activation of coagulation in small amounts with slow consumption of the coagulation factors. So the clotting factors are normal. Clinical features are minimum and lab abnormalities are the only evidence of DIC. It may occur in intrauterine death, liver disease, giant hemangiomas, malignancy, etc. Chronic DIC is a protracted disease which usually manifests as venous thrombosis. The lab findings show the platelet count to be normal or slightly decreased. Unlike acute DIC, in chronic DIC, the PT and APTT are normal, but the FDP, is, that is fibrin degradation product, is raised. Now coming to thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. This is associated with thrombotic complications. It is a rare disorder which is characterized by formation of highly microthrombi in the microcirculation of various organs due to the aggregation of platelets generally affects young female adults. It is characterized by a pentad of manifestations in the form of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, 
bleeding manifestations secondary to severe thrombocytopenia fluctuating neurological dysfunctions renal abnormalities and fever but all these five manifestations may not be present in all the patients but the first two that is microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and bleeding manifestations secondary to severe thrombocytopenia are the important manifestations which should be present in a case of ttp coming to the pathogenesis ttp is, is associated with a deficiency of adam ts13 which is known as the von willebrand factor metalloprotease which normally degrades the ultra large multimers of von willebrand factor in the absence of adam ts13 the multimers of the von willebrand factor accumulate in the plasma and cause platelet activation aggregation and thrombus formation this deficiency of adam ts that is absence or deficiency may be inherited due to inactivating mutations or may be acquired it can be induced by drugs like ticlopidine quinine tacrolimus and the increased there is an increased incidence with pregnancy or hiv infection in normal su uh, subjects the adam ts 13 causes lysis of these large multiples of one willebrand factor but in case of a patient with ttp this adam ts there is deficiency of the adam ts 13 and cleavage, cleavage of these um, large multimers of one willebrand factor does not occur which will cause adhesion and aggregation of the platelets and thereby causing thrombotic disorders formation of microthrombi and thrombotic disorders coming to the lab findings of ttp hemoglobin is moderate the treat fresh frozen plasma can be given the inciting agent should be removed but routine platelet transfusions are contraindicated. But in case of life-threatening hemorrhage, platelet transfusion can be considered. Splenectomy, antiplatelet drugs, steroids, vincristine can be tried in unresponsive cases. Coming to hemolytic, hemolytic uremic syndrome, it usually is classified along with TTP as TTP-HUS. It has more renal manifestations and fewer neurological sequelae than thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and it is characterized by a triad of acute renal failure thrombocytopenia and microangiopathic hemolytic anemia it predominantly occurs in infants and children and follows a diarrheal disease which is caused by either e coli or shigella formation of thrombi is limited to the renal microcirculation unlike in ttp where it can affect any circulation now coming to distributional thrombocytopenia as you all know, about one third of the circulating platelets are normally sequestered in the spleen. But in cases of splenomegaly and hypersplenism, about 90% of uh, um, uh, uh, platelets may be sequestered in the spleen. And this may be associated with leukopenia and or anemia. Although the circulating platelet count decreases, but the total platelet mass and overall platelet survival remain normal. Hence, these patients can have significant apparent thrombocytopenia, but they rarely manifest as clinical bleeding. They rarely present as clinical bleeding. Coming to dilutional thrombocytopenia, dilutional thrombocytopenia can occur when large quantities of packed RBCs are transfused to treat massive hemorrhage due to absence of viable platelets in the packed RBCs. This can be prevented by giving platelet concentrates to platelets receiving more than 20 units of packed RBCs in a 24-hour period. Now coming to the last topic of our discussion today, reactive thrombocytosis. As you all know, thrombocytosis refers to the increase in the platelet count above normal, that is above 4 lakh per cubic millimeter. It may be either primary or secondary. Secondary uh, thrombocytopenia is known as reactive thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytosis is most commonly reactive and it is secondary to increased levels of circulating cytokines that stimulate thrombopoiesis. It may be due to inflammatory, vasculitic, allergic disorders, may be due to acute and chronic infections, malignancies, hemolysis, iron deficiency and blood loss can lead to reactive thrombocytosis. Generally, in reactive thrombocytosis, platelet count is modestly elevated and as such, there is no significant clinical manifestation evidence of ongoing inflammation may be present which can be seen by raised crp raised esr etc 
Persistent thrombocytosis following splenectomy for chronic hemolytic anemia may result in increased risk of thromboembolic complications if hemolysis is not completely corrected. These are the causes of reactive thrombocytosis as I already discussed. Now coming to the take home message. Thrombocytopenia may be defined as a subnormal number of platelets in the circulating blood. Platelet has important role in the primary hemostatic mechanism. The causes of thrombocytopenia may be due to decreased production, increased destruction of platelets, distributional, dilutional or artifactual. HIT is an important cause of life or limb threatening thrombosis. Thrombocytosis refers to the increase in the platelet count above normal that is 4 lakh per cubic millimeter and this may be primary or secondary that is reactive. These are my references. Thank you for the patient hearing. Thank you. Thank very you so nicely much. done. Very nicely. Very clear in your concept and your speech. Very clearly deliberated. Excellent presentation, Dr. Rupsha. Very well. Thank you, sir. Thank Brilliant. you, sir. Brilliant. Content is so good and by the content we can see that you have really done a hard work. Very nice content. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Great. So you have already shared your PPT, so we will sh uh, upload that, making it the PDF. And let me okay. just see if there's any question on the YouTube. Please hold the line. Detailed out and very specific to the point. Everybody will really enjoy reading and learning from that. You are a very good teacher, Dr. Rupsha. Thank you, and, sir. Uh, Thank you for your compliment. We will, we will definitely call you back again for some other topic. Right. Okay, sir. Okay, Thank then you, take sir. care. Good night. God Good bless night. you. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. sir. Thank you. Bye. bye.